What is going on YouTube? It's Jake, aka Star Coding, coming at you with another video where we are talking about computer science. And today we're looking at we're looking at some blogs, we're looking at some hot takes. That is what we are doing. We got the uh, Mac Tech blog, you know, and I spend my mornings, I drink coffee, I do the whole thing, I'm cooking breakfast, I'm scrolling through my phone, I might be looking at media articles, I might be looking at Lobster or Lobster RS. Might be looking at the hacker news. I just, you know, like reading some news in the morning. Anyways, we came across this one blog. Uh, Stop deploying web application firewalls. Now, I, like, almost, like, choked a little bit on my coffee as I was drinking. I was like, whoa, holy, sh holy smokes. And, um, yeah, it, it caught my attention. Did a little, little read analysis over it. I thought it had some very interesting takes, um, you know, just about web application firewalls in general and how they're used and what the industry is doing with them. Uh, it's a good conversation to have, and so that's what we're doing. We're just having the conversation. Uh, we'll we'll go through this article. I'll throw some of my hot takes on top of it, and uh, yeah, in the comment section, y'all can fire away as well. So let's let's hop into it. Just a quick recap of what these uh, web application firewalls do. So we gotta think of them as a device that sits in between the end user and our website. I think if I pull up this guy, we can like you know we got our we got our user here. And we got our end end server that is serving all that beautiful uh, HTML and, and that JavaScript stuff over here. And I think, let's see here, green should work. We'll call it green. There's going to be like, you know, a little web application firewall that sits in the middle here. And he can be on the edge if it's like Cloudflare or uh, some of those bigger and more expensive firewalls that you can web application firewalls you can buy they can be on the edge and do edge compute so you know it's not going all the way to you know eastern us western us uh canada whatever africa australia wherever your website's hosted like it can go to an edge server and get processed there or it could just be a single node that is also in your region uh if you're like on-prem it could literally just be in the closet with you and what it's going to do it is a pretty much a rules engine all the requests that come this way into this guy, you know, it's checking that layer seven. It doesn't care about necessarily um, the stuff below. It doesn't it's a layer seven kind of or layer five firewall? So it's looking at your raw HTTPS information. It's looking, it's uh, unencrypting the TLS on it, checking the payload. Is the payload malicious? If it isn't, we'll send it to JavaScript and HTML. If it is. Uh, we'll just drop it right here, and we won't care about it. So that's kind of what the firewall is doing. Um, and so now let's dive in and talk about like kind of what these things are. I would read this word for word, but I would absolutely my dys my dyslexia would just be terrible, and y'all would be like, oh, Jake, what the y'all talking about? So essentially, what we're talking about here um, is that this person Mac doesn't think he's hearing enough people talk about the disadvantages of a web application firewall. It kind of just sounds like, hey, if you're doing full stack development, you might as well just put web application firewall in front of your application. It's a part of the process, you know? There is no, like, oh, there's an other alternative. It's just, you're building a website, you're building a front end, a back end, and before you uh, deploy it to production, you better have um, a WAF in front of it. Um, and this guy is here to offer another uh, perspective. It very much could be just, uh, this could be satire in all, all entirely. It just could be just like a call call to action. Like, hey, this is the very extreme. Let's not use a web application firewall because they are useful as we're going to find out. But uh, let's talk about, you know, what this is all about. So back in the day, he talks about internet history and how the HTML requests were pretty small um, as the web has grown over the past 20 years you can imagine that there's a lot more traffic on the internet and there's a lot bigger payloads uh, and so these WAFs are intercepting every single request on the internet and if you think about that if you think about how much processing is actually taking place on a packet level from just the millions of packets every single computer since the day there's a lot of compute power spent on processing HTTP packets. And it's kind of like, wow, if you, it's crazy. It's crazy when you think about it. Uh, I couldn't even like imagine, I don't even know how to imagine how many CPUs are running just processing uh, HTTP requests in the world. So, and it's, it seemed, it seemed like a good idea. 
HTTPS were tiny, but now they're getting bigger, especially with these JavaScript applications. And we're going to look at some performance. So if you think about this, if you have a WAF, um, the average request per second, average request per second, who knows what was the, um, okay, here we go. We got, we got something here. I'm trying to think of what, it was just an Nginx server. Okay. You know, when, when I look at, when I look at blog benchmarks, I always take it with a grain of salt. Cause it's like, what are you exactly testing? But just from metric to metric, you know, if it was, if it's node, if it's like go, if it's Python, whatever the web server is written in, um, it was getting a, approximately like an 80% performance boost with no laugh, 80% more traffic. Think about that at scale. That is quite a hampering number of requests that aren't coming through 80% of requests, like think on the scale of Amazon, think of the scale of like a walmart.com website, 80% of traffic. Uh, that's, that's pretty, that's a pretty big number with no laugh and the average time it takes to respond. You know, we're talking about kind of like a 40%, 50% uh, decrease in time. Um, I'm not really too worried about this. This just kind of happens with a part of the internet. And the uh, peak Nginx CPU utilization is also concerning. Like, look at that, dude. 73% uh, was the max. That's insane. That is an insane freaking number, dude. So, you know, this, this, uh, this WAF is cooking. It's cooking. It's doing stuff. And no WAF, obviously, uh, is chilling. But, you know, we, we are, we're, we're vulnerable. We don't have a, a WAF in front of us. So we, so we think. So we are slowing down every request. We're increasing the amount of RAM we need to buffer the request. And we're also just, you know, using our CPU to the max to process all these regex expressions. And if you think about it, you know, we still have these WAFs in front of all of the websites and we hear about vulnerabilities happening all the time, all the time. Stuff is getting hacked. Websites are getting broken. It's fucking, it's just terrible. Like log for shell. And if you think about it, it's because all these rules, this engine things are just done with what we know today. And if you really, if you're a sophisticated attacker, you can really trick these WAFs uh, into, you know, getting, you can bypass them with uh, making your expressions extremely, extremely interesting, one could say. And another way to bypass the WAF is just to pad your attack about 80 kilobytes or so. Uh, and most WAFs have a cutoff point to avoid spending infinite CPU and RAM on a single request. So for AWS, if you made your uh, attack after the eight kilobyte mark, um, you could you know have your attack go through without the WAF even looking at it. So clearly you have these WAFs that are here to stop attacks but they're not doing it. If it's like a novel attack, it doesn't matter if you have a WAF or not, like you're getting attacked. So I can see why it's like, huh, you're spending all this, you're using a bunch of CPU stuff, you're using a bunch of RAM, you're slowing down requests on a global scale, like on a, every website's doing this pretty much. Any any enterprise website is doing this, uh, which so it's, you know, it makes you think, it makes you take a step back. So, yeah. Um, and then this is kind of just talks about like the attack vectors more and more about that. Uh, just, you know, talking about like, dang, you are spending a lot of money. This is a premium service and it's not really working out. You, and it's always like not open source, it's closed sourced. So it's interesting to talk about some, uh, high false positive rates, which, you know, it just happens in life. It happens especially I think he was here was like talking about like putting a comment down. Like you're like, uh, talking about log for shell in a YouTube comment or something like that. And just bam, uh, they see that and they're like, Oh, you're banned. <laughs> that's, that's not fun. So we were talking about all this stuff. Uh, let's talk about some alternatives and what it really comes down to is building the website, building the website and design the website in a secure fashion. If we shift left, I guess, oh man, that buzzword, so fun. If we shift left with our security thinking, we can make a secure website with isolation, immutability, static analysis, and, uh, you know, capability-based security. Isolation being the fact that, you know, 
maybe, just maybe, we could make... I think this is what... I want to make sure I'm not, like, jumping the gun on this guy. I love this one, capability-based security. Not every API endpoint needs to have unrestricted read-write access to the entire database. I don't know about y'all, but in my beginning days of making websites, I was like, yeah, dude, like, here's my database key. Uh, Freaking backend, go at it. Like, you can do whatever you want with it. I was I was that guy. I was that novice. Um, and it's one of those things where if you make your endpoints only be able to do what they're supposed to do, if they get compromised, if something happens, it's not the end of the world. Like, sure, you can have some validation on your backend to make sure that nothing too terrible is happening. But if you actually do get exposed, it doesn't have complete and total access to do whatever it wants. It can be stopped and mitigated, or I guess like the uh, the amount of damage can be tolerated. Isolation, ensuring that breach in one component cannot affect the rest of the system. Uh, browsers do this by executing all code and special sandboxes um, that can't save your passwords or access cookies. Imagine how slow the web would be if every single piece of JavaScript needed to be analyzed by hundreds of regexes before being executed. Um, and so they have microservices are designed with isolation in mind. So, you know, just, I guess, talking about isolation, code isolation, very cool. This immutability thing, um, I guess, like serving your website on top of a read-only file system. Um, and a package manager that requires rebooting. I would need to read more on this to know exactly what the benefits are for here, but I'm imagining like, you know, you have a website that is a read-only file system. Uh, no one can maliciously drop rootkits on your system. I don't know how they would. I'm sure there's a bunch of ways they could, but uh, <laughs> you don't have to worry about there being uh, persistent data stored on your system. So I, I'm, I imagine there's like some uh, Docker images or something out there that you could, you know, kind of build your website on your Nginx web server on top of, which would be kind of cool. Uh, stack analysis. One of those things where like, hey, we have these tools that kind of shift left already. What if we ship code that doesn't have vulnerabilities in it? That's, you know, verifiably safe. Um, we don't need a WAF to check for that. If we know where, if we can verify that we're safe, we're cool. And it's one of those things where like, yeah, there's always going to be the chance that you get hacked. Um, but having a WAF in front of it, it's going to do the same rules checking. Like if someone comes up with a sophisticated attack to break your, 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 you know, your stack analysis that you did, well, you know, your WAF wasn't going to be able to do it either way. So you still got hacked. Your request was just a little quicker. Um, and now he will admit these ideas are quite broad. You'll need to adapt them to your particular app. WAF vendors offer a one WAF fits all that he can't match. But let's just talk about, so that, that's kind of it, guys. That's kind of the article. We're talking about how much performance is hampered by these web application firewalls, RAM, CPU, network speeds on a global scale. On a global scale. Everything is slower. Everything is using more CPU power than it needs to. And I do somewhat agree with this man. Um, I don't think that the answer is just to stop deploying web application firewalls because they still have like a really good use case. There's two really good use cases that come to mind with these guys. One is legacy systems. I know everyone's working with the latest Next.js, the latest Golang, Lua. Everyone's having, well, not Lua, uh, Elixir. Everyone's having a great time programming these days, but there are still applications out there written in PHP that haven't been touched in a very long time. Websites written in Perl. Websites written in who knows what. But um, they're very old and that have minimum maintainers maintaining them. And in those situations, having, an, having a WAF in front of it, it's very good because uh, they don't... The company does need to hire developers to kind of transfer it over to this new age style of websites. It can stay its old way. It's, you know... If it, if it doesn't break, don't fix it. That kind of like mentality. You can just have a WAF in front of it and stop all the uh, bad things that are coming your way. So if you have a legacy code base, it makes sense to have a WAF. Um, and another thing is like when something bad happens in the world, like a new zero day of vulnerability is discovered with uh, this with your dependency that you've been using since day one, you're like, wow, we are fucked. Uh, when that happens... 
having a WAF, you can get that rule set in within, you know, two minutes, five minutes. Microsoft, Cloud, Cloudflare, whatever the vendor is that you're using is going to have a new rule automatically, you know, pre-installed in there, ready for you to go, or I guess it'll be updated on the fly. So the I guess if you had to build it yourself, who knows, it might take a week, it might take two weeks for your team to respond and actually make a patch for that vulnerability, whereas a WAF can just block all requests within, you know, two, five minutes. Um, but I think the solution kind of is somewhere in the middle. You know, we were talking about um, someone in here, we were, we were talking about, you know, SQL injection. And if you use stack analysis, you know your code is good. I really like the idea of having someone on the team dedicated to the firewall. Not not like just purely dedicated to the firewall, they can do other things, but like someone, we're going to make a sprint dedicated to handling the web application firewall rule set. Because I know so many people will just take the default Cloudflare, the default AWS, the default Azure firewall rules and just slap them on there and not even think about the CPU utilization and like, you know, the request bandwidth it's going to take. If you can go through there one by one, add the rules that matter, take out the dumb rules, take out the over overly simplistic rules that you know are not going to affect your system, but only the ones and make some custom rules that actually matter. I think you can have a system in place that yes, it's doing its job. It's making it just, it makes sure, make sure the requests look a certain way. That's all it needs to do. Don't check for all these little nuances. Make sure the request looks like the way it should. Uh, we can we can minimize our regex expression usage. That is the goal. If you have a stellar team of all A plus developers, which is so rare these days, but if you do have that team, freaking raw dog it, dude. Don't even have a web application firewall. Are you confident in your team? If you if you're paying them the big bucks to build a a website, yeah, just go go for it raw dog the website without a web application firewall but um that's my opinion i think that you know having time taking the time to actually plan out your rules we're talking about regexes that take up a lot of cpu utilization let's go back to that chart real quick i mean like it was it was a blog test so it's not a certified um purdue um MIT case reviewed. Oh God, my face is blocking that. 75 to 8% guy right there. Yeah, it's not MIT or Georgia Tech certified paper, but there's some there's some stuff happening there. Um, so having the custom rules instead of just the default rules, huge help. If you have a great team, maybe you don't need the WAF. But um yeah, I think it I think this is just a good conversation to have, a good thing to talk about. And um, yeah, let me know what you're, what you're thinking below. That's all we got today, guys. So uh, peace.